when we open doors rather than close them, when we make time for conversations rather than cutting them off, when we greet people with open arms rather than you know, pushing people backwards and saying, this is, this is not the time, you should wait. When we act in a way that is that intentional, it lets people know that they can show up fully as who they are. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this edition of the Together Apart series. My name is Kristen Duquette, and I am a One Young World Ambassador from the United States. Today, I have to be honored to be here with Carrie Gray and Justice Shorter, two phenomenal women in their own right, who are behind the Black Disabled Lives Matter movement. In the wake of the George Floyd protests, the narrative of Black people with disabilities was largely left behind, and they wanted to ensure that this moment could spark positive action to address the lack of representation and inequity faced across the board. Welcome. Uh, to start us off, for those listening who may not be familiar with this term, could you both define and explain ableism for us? Hi there. So this is Justice Shorter. I'd be happy to. So I'll describe ableism based off of the working definition created by Talila Lewis in conversation with many other disabled advocates, as well as Dustin Gibson, especially. And they describe ableism as a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, excellence, and productivity. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in anti-Blackness, eugenics, colonialism, and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's appearance and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. And I also just wanted to point out here within this, this working definition, we can come to understand that ideas around normalcy are deeply rooted in white supremacy, right? Using uh, whiteness as the central point for defining what is normal, what is right, what is the standard, what is the status quo. And this definition kind of clearly refines that. I also love to mention that we build a lot of our work and the things that we do off of the shoulders, off of the, the, the work and the, the efforts that have been put forth by Black people with disabilities for decades. So we are not necessarily the creators of the Black Disabled Lives Movement. We have been saying, and Black advocates, Black disabled advocates have been saying that our lives matter um, for several, several years now. And we have been trying to find different ways to infuse that into ongoing conversations around Black liberation. Um, and the action that we did on June 6th was just another outpouring of that particular type of, of activism and advocacy. Yeah, so this is Carrie. I, I think just to add to that, when I describe ableism, or I think about ableism, I think of it as just anything that prevents people from disability of achieving their rights and access to this concept of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness based on the concept that they are a person with a disability, they are perceived as a person with a disability. And so what's not, I think something that is actually very common is that folks are concerned or confused about how much people with disabilities can do and contribute to society. And due to that confusion, concern, or just straight up ignorance sometimes, they have been denied access to things like public education, healthcare, housing, um, the list goes on. And so all of these like policies, procedures, ideologies that prevent people from disabilities of achieving their rights, of achieving access to anything society is ableism. Um, so I know that our, our work is committed to fighting against ableism and informing people of how it's not something that you can do just because a person has the disability and it might seem like the logical thing. And in fact, it's, it's very inhumane. Um, and we have to make sure that we are creating a society that is inclusive of all people. Yeah, these are really great points. And building off of uh, Justice, you mentioned how 
you and Carrie led and, and organized a really great uh, advocacy on June 6th in Washington, D.C. for Black Disabled Lives Matter and, and led it straight to the White House. And to that point, what can the world learn um, about activism and advocacy from young people of color with disabilities regarding this work? Yeah, this is justice. I, I would say one of the things that they can learn is how to listen and how to make space. We show up in a number of ways. And Carrie and I fully recognize that, which is why we had two different threads of our um, action that day. We had the OGT, which was the on the ground team. These were individuals who could physically show up in the streets. Um, we, you have to bear in mind that we are still in the throes of the coronavirus pandemic, which is disproportionately impacting people of color in general, Black people in particular, and people with disabilities as well. And so we knew that a lot of folks may not uh, have been able to join us in the streets, which is why we also created an RST, which is a remote support team, which gave folks the ability to equally contribute to what we were doing that day because that level of creativity and ingenuity is what really pushes a movement forward and we wanted to be fully inclusive of that so often as people with disabilities we have sometimes been silenced ignored pushed aside and thought to not be equal contributors um, to movements or to actions and we wanted to do work that was completely um, uh, immersed in this idea that everyone could show up in whatever way was most suitable for them and only they could determine what that is. Um, so that is that is what you know, kind of pushed us forward in doing this work. And it was amazing because you also learn that when you make space for people, they can bring forth their ideas, they bring forth their equipment, they bring forth their, their experiences, and it only makes the event that much better, that much more powerful, um, that much more participatory, right? So when we open doors rather than close them, when we make time for conversations rather than cutting them off, when we greet people with open arms, rather than you know, pushing people backwards and saying, this is, this is not the time, you should wait. When we act in a way that is that intentional, it lets people know that they can show up fully as who they are. So I tell people quite often, when I show up, I do so as my Black, blind, lesbian self, and I do so without asking anybody for permission to do so. And that is what we encourage folks to do. And I mention that because as we were out there, we were pushing forth the message that Black disabled lives matter, but we were also simultaneously amplifying the message that Black women's lives matter and Black trans lives matter because there are Black trans folks with disabilities. There are Black women with disabilities. There are Black people with disabilities. And we wanted to make sure that those messages and those stories were amplified. I think the world could learn a lot about how to ensure that no one gets left behind, that we truly get to a place of collective liberation by first starting with people with disabilities. There's no racial justice without disability justice. There's no disability justice without racial justice. As many of our advocates and, and colleagues with disabilities who are Black and people of color will tell you. Absolutely. Um, this is Carrie. I think when it comes to what the world can learn from young people of color around activism and advocacy is one, we want to share with the world the connection between racism, ableism, and state violence. And so, um, you know, when I, I, I'm in, I have so much appreciation and love for the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, one of the things that I stand behind and that many people stand behind is that when we say Black Lives Matter, we are talking about all Black lives. But to be honest, um, when we think about the history of civil rights and everything that has happened, it has not always been that way. We have at times been talking about Black Men Lives Matter or, or just certain types of people. And so now we are in a place where we are naming all of our intersections and genuinely trying to show the message that no one gets left behind. And so part of that conversation that we want to uplift is when we, we are talking about Black queer folks, we are talking about black, black women, we are talking about Black immigrants, and we are talking about Black disabled people. 
And so I think the protests that, you know, we were able to participate in this summer was us trying to build on the conversation, was us trying to expand the conversation and ensure that people understand that the fatal consequences of state violence are, not, are, are racism and ableism, are racism and homophobia and transphobia and so many different things. And so we want people to understand this concept of intersectionality we want people to understand that it's not just a conversation, but this is something that has really critical and detrimental consequences if we don't get this right. And so to explore that, to grapple with it, to know that it's not always easy to, to, to understand, you know, all of these different narratives that are happening at once, but we are determined to get people to that point. And we were determined to build policies and programs that are changing our society and decreasing the amount of violence that the Black community is experiencing. Absolutely. I, I love both of your points. And speaking on transitioning that conversation to action with that intersection of justice and identity and leaving no one behind. My next question is, how can global institutions focus on education, employment, and entrepreneurship better support young people of color with disabilities in such a crucial time? So this is, this is Carrie, I'll hop in there. And one, I wanna say I really appreciate this question because now, now is the time to hone in and be developing programs and resources for disabled people of color. Um, if we think about justice and where we currently are in terms of movement work, and we think about the future, it is absolutely inclusive of disability justice at the intersection of racial justice, at the intersection of every type of justice that you can imagine. Intersectionality um, is the future and it is our now and it is our presence. And so when we're thinking about like, what does it mean to be supportive? I wanna say there are so many options. A couple of areas that I'll point out is um, there needs to be a lot of development in terms of leadership, management, even things like the skill sets of accounting, of finances, of entrepreneurship. There's so many different options of these are fundamental skills that can be transferred in, in all of these different arenas, whether it's employment, whether it's education, you know, whether it's business, like whatever the case may be. So there are fundamental skills that Black folks just have not been get, granted access to proportionately across our community. So that meaning there have been typically a select few who have been able to make it, who have been able to get, you know, the, the opportunities that they need and that they're looking for when it comes to those industries, but the large majority of folks have not. And so to develop programs that I think are intentionally, intentionally centered and saying, we want to develop a program that is for disabled people of color. We want to develop opportunities that are led by disabled people of color. Those are the types of things that would make a tremendous difference to your own organization and to society at large. This is justice. So I, I suggested that we talk about this because I know this is Carrie saying. I know she loves this topic a lot. And I feel like we need to have a moment to really talk about entrepreneurship and employment and education. I just want to, I'm, I'm not even want to add a ton to that because I think Carrie covered it very well. I have, I'll, I'll give a personal story. I have applied for countless global positions and programs and I have been thwarted at several turns because a website is inaccessible. And by the time the, the web map gets back to me, the position has already closed. So I have to call family members, cousins, my sisters to help me with applications so that I can put information through. And you have to realize, especially on a global scale, a lot of these applications are very long, multifaceted applications. You have to put in tons of background information and every single job has to be uploaded into their specific platform. And so although it may hit the, the basic standards of, of accessibility in terms of, yes, it is accessible technically, the usability could be dreadful. And it could be something that inadvertently or directly kind of keeps individuals with disabilities from being involved with whatever the program or whatever the, the, the position is. So it effectively keeps 
us out. The same could be said about attitudinal biases. So yes, you can get through in terms of the application, but when you get to the interview stage and you are sitting before someone who is literally waving a piece of paper in your face asking you what you're able to see, that's an experience that I, I personally have as a blind woman. And that, that also keeps you out of the workforce, right? So it's the accessibility barriers, it is the attitudinal biases, and then of course it is the securing of accommodations once you're actually brought on uh, to a job. But all of these things need to be uh, taken into consideration at the beginning as opposed to at the end or casually considered afterwards. We need to make sure that we're getting people, we're recruiting them, but we're also retaining them. Absolutely. Uh, I keep I keep saying after every single answer both of you are giving, I'm like, absolutely, yes, I we need more of this. And um, as the world wrestles with crisis after crisis, uh, obviously we're still in COVID, what message about survival and solidarity do you particularly have with girls of color with disabilities in this moment right now? So I think the message, uh, when I think of women of color with disabilities, my heart just starts to explode with so much like love and joy. And I just think of all of the memories that I've been blessed to create and the future that, that I see that is inclusive of, of women of color with disabilities. And, and I'm thinking particularly of my black young sisters that I've claimed like I'm just having a whole moment just thinking about naming them. But um, I think the message that I would love to say is that you matter. And I think it's so important that we don't stop believing or advocating for how much we matter. And I wanna express that because um, just a little bit of knowledge that I might have about what it means to be a woman of color here in the United States in particular, it is just inevitable that you will experience pain, brutality, the co-opting of your culture. Um, and that can be in a professional setting, that can be in social settings, this can be about all of the different areas that you exist in your life. And the numbers are raw. I'm thinking about my womenists um, that may be tuning in. I'm thinking about my feminists that may be tuning in. And you know that the numbers are super raw when it comes to the amount of violence that we experience in the midst of us trying to just be successful and still not getting paid adequately and still getting overlooked for so many different things, right? And so I think it's so critical that we form community with each other and that we stay in community with each other and we never allow those adversities to silence us. Um, so again, I think the message that I would just wanna have to, to my black and, and to people of color with disabilities, um, our women, our girls, is just to remember how much you matter. This is Justice. I think Carrie conveyed that beautifully. I woke up this morning feeling so heavy and so tired and I thought to myself, I don't have anything left to give. I don't even know how I'll answer these questions from the Young World Series. I don't even know what I have to say because I woke up to the news today about Jacob Blake, who was a Black man killed in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, only about 40 minutes away or so from where I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and he was killed by police officers. He was unarmed. They shot him seven times in the, black, in the back as Black women. You could hear him in the background pleading and screaming for his life. For police officers to spare his life, you can hear them saying, don't you do it. Don't you do it. And I thought how often we have spoken out, we have raised our voices, and we have been ignored. And it just deflated me this morning. But then I took a minute I paused, I breathed, I did a little bit of grieving. At the point of, of us recording right now, he is still alive and I pray that he pulls through. But I had to also grieve for all of us who have, who have died in, in recent years and even in not so recent years, whether it be by the coronavirus pandemic, whether it be by the, 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 what people have now considered to be um, 
a lot of the casual deaths that are not recorded uh, as much, for example, the people who are dying from poverty, the people who are dying from a lack of equitable access to health care, uh, people who are, are dying from malnutrition. Just there's so many different ways that we are being confronted with these challenges on a day to day basis. So I had to grieve for all of that this morning. I had to take a beat, a moment for myself today just to breathe and to grieve. But then after I did that, I also thought to all of the ancestors who surround me. So although I may feel alone and although you may feel alone as a young woman of color with a disability, please understand that you are surrounded by the ancestors. So there are people who came before you. There are people who are existing now around you, irrespective of whether or not you know it. There are other black and brown and beautiful young women with disabilities who are around you in this global space. And there are also people who will come after you. So you are surrounded in a very literal and metaphorical sense by other black women with disabilities and without who will help guide you forward. And I hope that you will hold on to that when we literally feel as if we have nothing else to hold on to because you are enough and you are deserving of a life that is free of vitriol and violence and hatred and pain and persecution. You are deserving of so much more. So I hope you'll continue to build and you'll continue to dream and continue to know that your life matters and that something like freedom, something like liberation is for you. And it hopefully will be made into reality sooner rather than later in your lifetime. Those are beautiful words, both of you. Going off of that, if I could, I mean, you know, those are just so powerful. How can people like myself and that aren't disabled and are not of color uh, become better allies and accomplices to the Black Disabled Lives Matter movement? Carrie, I'll let you take this. I know you have a couple ideas and then I'll just build. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, to our allies, what I would say is speak up, invest, and take action. So what I mean by that is um, sometimes depending on your industry, your position, you know, things to that nature, you may be hesitant to speak up about racial injustice and, and, and other things to that nature because it can rock the vote. You know, if we're going to be honest about our circumstances and our situation, sometimes we have leadership, sometimes we have board members, sometimes we have funders that want to put racial justice to the side, want to put disability justice to the side, and things of that nature. And so we, and when I say me, I actually mean our allies in particular, have to make very solid and confident decisions about speaking up and using their voice to spread education and to hold people accountable for the decisions and policies and practices that are made. I think the second thing when we talk about investing really just goes back to what we talked about earlier. There are a lot of needs across our community and investing can mean a variety of different things. Investing can mean financially, you know, donating, or sometimes it's not even donating. Sometimes it's supporting black businesses, black disabled businesses, you know, and things to that nature. But investing and in ensuring that folks have the resources, the mentors, anything that they need to make it to that next step, to make it to that next level. And then finally taking action. So action meaning that you become a person, your voice I think is extremely powerful and we do need people that are speaking up. But sometimes we need, a, another step to that. Sometimes we need folks that have connections to your police departments and that are scheduling meetings. Sometimes we need folks that know our city council members and our mayor's offices and saying, what are you doing about state violence and police brutality that is happening across our community? So if you have that type of connection, if you can think of whatever connections that you do have and, and, and nothing is too small, then that is steps of actions that we need to get that much closer to our dreams and our visions of liberation. So again, I, I would say as an ally, you, you need to be making decisions and you need to be thinking about um, and being confident in how you're going to speak up, how you can invest, and how you can take action. 
this is justice. I would just also add to that. So believe no one who tells you that there's only one way to advocate or one way to learn or one way to be a part of something. Um, there, I am an avid reader. I am literally voracious. I read multiple books a week because it's also more accessible to me. And it, it's, it's just, it's an easier form for me to be able to comprehend a lot of information. So I, reading is my pathway. But for you, it might be podcasts. It might be webinars or short YouTube videos. It might be articles or blogs. Whatever medium is best and most accessible to you, I would say, please dive in. There's so much information out there and conversation discussions that are happening right now. There's literally no reason to not be well informed, but not only having that connection to some of the, the material that's being provide, provided online, and that's a little bit disconnected, um, but also connect and tap into your very communities, right? So that doesn't mean overly uh, taxing the people of color with disabilities around you and saying you need to spoon feed me every single solution you need to you need to, it's your responsibility to educate me we definitely don't want you to have that mentality because that's also exhausting and it is definitely not appreciated again because there's so much information out there but then also again you can simply ask the question of hey i am here if you if there's something you need me to do or something you want me to do i'm going you know please do let me know i have these ideas that, that i can bring to the table in terms of some of the things that i i after doing a lot of reading or researching or listening myself that i think would be good that i can help out on um do you think this is, is good you know can i can i get your thoughts on this if, if you don't have time i get it i'll go you know find some other people no worries um but there's also other white folks who are doing this work who are in community with other white folks trying to get them together on these issues um and the same could be said for other you know people of color without disabilities who are trying to get each other together around making sure that we make space for all of us uh, to get towards liberation. Absolutely. All of this, all justice and carry, all of your thoughts that you have provided uh, are not just thoughts and everyone, including myself, we can all do a better job to act and to move this forward for actual tangible change for young persons with disabilities of color. Um, so before we close, um, can each of you tell our audience how they can best follow and support your work going forward? Sure, this is Carrie Gray. You can follow me on Twitter at Carrie underscore Gray, which is K-E-R-I underscore G-R-A-Y. You can follow me on Instagram at Carrie Gray 90. And I also encourage you to follow the National Alliance of Multicultural Disabled Advocates. Um, this is a group where we really want to build in coalition and collaboration with so many existing organizations and individuals that have been doing this work. And we just want to do our part. Um, so the National Alliance of Multicultural Disabled Advocates, you can follow us on Twitter um, at advocates underscore named, um, which is N-A-M-D. Um, and we would love to connect. Hey there, this is Justice. Um, I had took a five-year hiatus from Twitter, so I'm rocking with like five followers, but it's fine. You can reach me on Twitter at Justice Shorter One. That is J-U-S-T-I-C-E-S-H-O-R-T-E-R One um, on Twitter. And reach me anytime and reach out if you guys have ideas or you need someone to build with. There's also some really great um, things that's, that's popping up. A lot of us just do advocacy and partnership with folks that we know and we try to build things that we didn't have for ourselves. So on September 26, myself and Conchita Hernandez, who is another dope blind woman who's Latinx and who does extraordinary work in this space, but we're going to hopefully put on an event for blind women of color um, to be able to connect with one another and have conversations in a very informal and chill way. Um, but just giving ourselves the type of community that we didn't have growing up. So I hope to continue doing just events like this to breathe life and joy and connection into the spaces and the communities that I love the most. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this conversation. Um, let's give a big, big thank you to Carrie and Justice for their time make sure to like comment and share this session and thank you for listening take care